Well, hello, everybody. I'm Jen Valenga, and we are live streaming today. Hello, and I'm JRT, and we are the co-founders of Voice First World. If you don't know what we do, we coach leaders to speak with courage and clarity without being perfect so that they can influence change in the workplace, which also influences change in their lives. That's what we do. This is, as we said, the Speak With Presence podcast live streaming. Yes, and if you're watching us on the replay, we appreciate you taking the time to stop by. But I always just want to remind everyone that we have one goal with this live stream, and that's to uncover what's stopping women from speaking up. So Jen, today, we've been waiting for this day to announce who we have as a powerful speaker. So I'm going to hand this over to you to somehow be brief within less than 30 minutes to describe who we are interviewing today so we can actually interview her. We could literally talk about her for 30 minutes and then bring her on. Sonal Shaw is who we have today. She's the Interim Executive Vice President for Worldwide Network Advancement at the United Way Worldwide. She is an incredible woman, and I have to say I'm kind of fangirling. <laughs> she, the things that she has done, the things that she's done are really impactful, but I think the thing that has struck me the most about her is that when we met her before today, briefly, she is so ca- casual is not the right word necessarily, but she's so authentic. And you know, we talk about authenticity. You have to be yourself. You can't, you don't have to be perfect. But when I did my further research on her later, I went, oh my gosh, she's like a really big deal. Yeah. She's a big deal. So let me tell you a little bit about the things that make her such a big deal. What she's doing now, working with United Way Worldwide, which she'll talk about a little bit. She was the former deputy assistant to President Obama, my fangirl part. (laughs) She last year was the founder of the Asian American Federation for to support Asian American and Pacific Islanders after all of that Asian hate that happened in the spring of 21. And what I love that she did about that was it was not only to address the hate and the violence against Asians, but also because it's a, she wanted to promote belonging and identity. And I think that that's so important to the work that we're doing and making sure that women understand that they have an identity that they don't need to hide, that they need to share, even if it's imperfect. So that work is incredible. She has worked in her career. She's been a professor at Georgetown. She's worked at Google.org. She's worked at Goldman Sachs. She, I think one of the fascinating things to me is when she was a young woman, I think right out of university, she and her siblings founded IndyCore, which is an organization to bring Indian individuals from of Indian descent from around the world back to India to do projects, to projects to work on, how, did, how does she say it, to work on developmental projects in India. And I think to start something, a nonprofit like that when you're so young, really sh- helps you understand the kind of person that she is from the very beginning. So I think that that's enough to share. If you want to know the official bio, go to the show notes when we post the podcast, the audio podcast on all the platforms. So what do you think, JRT? You did a very good job, but there's so much more. There's There's so much more. Mm -hmm. So I'd like for you at this time to share a little surprise. Okay. What our person, Sanal, does not know is we have a special message for her today. Yes. Do you mind playing it? I am going to play it, but I have to say this because you know I do this to you all the time. No. It's sonal. What did I say? Sonal. Sonal. Yes. Sonal. And you're going to hear it. In the green room. This is what I deal with every day. I can't help myself. Words, they mean oh. things. Pronunciation. Oh. Okay, JRT, here we go. Uh, you're There are a lot of things one could say about Sonal Shaw and her experience and background and professional accomplishments. But what is even more important is Sonal the person. She is a loving, warm, caring, and loyal friend. 
If you're going through a rough patch, if you just need a listening ear, or if you're seeking a sound bite of wisdom, then Sonal is the person to call. Sonal loves people and she has a heart for doing good. She wants to see people thrive, to be successful, to live their best lives, and anything that she can do to support that person, she'll do. She'll do, she was saying, and I hit the button too soon. JRT, should we bring her on from the green room? Yes. Let's welcome Sonal. 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 There you go. (laughs) (laughs) We want to bring someone on laughing. (laughs) This is that was so awesome. I loved it. Oh, good. We love to start with making sure you know what an impact you've made on the people closest to you. So thank you to Angela for sharing. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. That was so great. And Jen and JRT, I love listening to the two of you. I could listen to you all day long. It's so awesome. We're not perfect. (laughs) Nor should we be. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Okay, JRT. I want to say one thing Got it. before we get started, and I want to do a very special shout out to a friend of mine from many, many years, and that is Tara Claussen. She is the CEO of the Kanza United Way, which is here in Manhattan, Kansas. She lives and breathes to serve our community. She has done an amazing job and has really brought forth some amazing work through the United Way. And so without her, we would not be here with you today. Mm-hmm. So I want to do a shout out to her, to the board members, and to all those that serve and give to make our community better. So thank you. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Tara. <laughs> okay, Sonal. Um, first <laughs> things first. At the United Way, you are serving as the interim uh, vice president. And I understand that you have quite an executive team of women. I'd like to know how that impacts your work life and the organization as a whole, if you could share a little bit about that. Well, first of all, I also want to thank Tara, because I think it's amazing that we have these incredible leaders at United Ways that run their local United Ways. They're in their communities. They're working in their communities. They're making so much change. And we should celebrate everybody that's serving at the United Way. We should especially celebrate the women that are leading the United Ways and are doing such an amazing job. It just, it just shows, shows leadership. And I think that leadership happens at every level. And that, that leads to the same question you asked, Jen, which is, um, you know, I get to work with an incredible group of women who are in leadership at uh, UWW. And what's been amazing about it is we are partners in so many ways. I think women and by nature are collaborative and we always want to figure out how to work with each other and how to do things together. Just listening to your dialogue is a great example of we're, we're always willing to hear each other and then sort of listen and say what we need to do. And I think if we embrace the best of who we are as women and the skills that we bring, which is the collaboration, which is the ensuring we make everybody else work better, ensuring that we can we can promote and, and together get to the outcome that we want. Um, that's what I get to do every day at United Way. And that's what I get to do every day with the team that I work with in the United Way, but also the people I work with across the network who are just incredible leaders. I love that. That's Set, make such an impact when you are in a collaborative environment. As, as somebody who spent my career in theater, that is what we do. We collaborate. So when we step outside of those spaces, sometimes we think, why, why isn't collaboration happening? Why isn't that going on? Because mm-hmm. it's just embedded in the culture there. And I think it's you're right. Women do that authentically and naturally. It's not to say that men don't. There's amazing good guys out there. But I think when you get a group of women together, they do listen and respond and react off of the ideas that come from each other. Thank you for that. Yeah. We like to ask first, this is an interesting one for you because you've been on the TED stages. You've spoken in many arenas. In fact, if you're watching and you want to go Google Sonal Shaw on YouTube, you'll find a lot of incredible speeches and and 
interviews that she's given. So my question to you is, can you tell us a story about a time or share a story with us about a time when you were perhaps nervous about speaking? That doesn't have to be on the stage necessarily, but you had to use your voice and it was a challenge for you. Is there a time like that that you ended up feeling like a powerful speaker? Yeah, that's such a great question. And it's funny, it's we don't actually ask that of ourselves enough. I feel like we're always sort of talking about, oh, that was a great speech. You only see the outcome of the speech. You never see the going into the speech and how <laughs> nerve wracking it is. I think the place where I'm always the most nervous when I speak actually is to university students and young people. Um, and it's not because I, I don't know how to speak to them, but it's largely because they're so, I mean, I'm so much older than them, but I always want to be able to know where they are and understanding what questions and concerns and um, especially young women and just the questions they ask and the sharpness by which they ask the questions. Um, I'm always like, okay, can, can I articulate it in a way that is consistent with what they're hearing? Can we think about how to have a dialogue as opposed to me telling you that this is the only way to do something? I worry sometimes in speeches that we come across as we all have the answers. And what we get lost in is, we, we forget is that it was a process. There were people that helped you along the way. There were people like, there's a bit of luck that comes with a lot of success. Um, it's not just all about you doing it yourself. There's there's a lot of, of back and forth in that process. So I'm always nervous because I'm nervous that I want to make sure we convey the key points, but there's an authenticity to keeping an open dialogue so people could find their own path. And it's not just you're not giving advice, you're sort of giving a roadmap of how you might think about it. Can you think of a, a university that you've spoken at that you, Gosh. yeah. I, I'll give you a couple. So I, when I first started at Harvard, I used to run, I was a fellow at Harvard and I used to run a session on technology and um, engagement and how to engage people in technology. There were 30 kids in that class. And I, I was so nervous the first time I went because I swear I, they know so much more about technology than I do. <laughs> and I felt like I was, a, I was the fool that was going to go in and they're going to like peel back the curtain curtain and be like, you don't really know what you're talking about. You're just saying all this stuff. So I like, I over prepared for the class. I over prepared for all the questions. Um, I over prepared with the speaker and realized that at the end of it, like they just wanted to have a dialogue and it was actually a very good dialogue, but I was so scared going in that I actually was like, okay, oh, they're, they're, they're going to, they're going to tell me, I don't know anything I'm talking about. And that was what I was scared of. And did they? Uh, they did not tell me that, which was good. Um, but what they did, uh, what they did, you know, let me know is like, here are the other ways we're using technology, because I only had a perspective that I had seen, but I hadn't seen it from their perspective, which is actually a, a really great learning moment for me to be able to hear that and to be able to then incorporate it into speeches moving forward. But I felt the same way at Georgetown the first time I taught my first class, by the way, which was like, oh, my God, they're going to think I'm a fool. I have to I have to deliver this curriculum. I'm not really sure it's the right curriculum, um, but it's 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 a process. <laughs> oh my gosh! I spent 25 years in academia as a professor, instructor, assistant professor, all the all the ways, and I started to recognize that feeling of anxiety in myself in, in August, sometime of like I'm not prepared. I don't know. And finally, it always happened every year, every semester. It didn't matter. But the thing I finally got comfortable with is understanding that I teach to the group, to who's in the room. So I could only, I could really only prepare until I met them. Right. And I would kind of let it go and feel a little nervous and then go, okay, I've met this group. Now I know right. what they can teach me and how we can collaborate together to uncover some interesting challenge that we were trying to overcome. But I think students, university students are incredibly gifted at collaborating really and helping us understand because they are, the world is moving fast and they're the ones who are observing it in a, a different time continuum than we are in a way. Exactly. <laughs> and what's beautiful about it is when you're in a university setting is it's about thinking and it's not about the answers. It's about how do we think about getting to the answers. So what I love being about it with universities and especially with students, whether it's in high schools or in universities, is that you're in the process of learning and you're not in the process of knowing everything. 
If it's done well, for sure. Yeah. So we're going to transition this to, to women. I'm going to let you go, JRT. Thank you, Jen. So I want you to think through all of the experience, all the different roles and all the different hats that you have worn. And tell us a little bit about what you believe happens women when women don't speak up in the workplace and how does it impact the organization? Gosh, that is such a great question. I think about this all the time, especially even now when I'm sitting in a room as are people speaking, who's speaking, paying attention to it. I, you know, I, I'll just start with my own experience and then sort of walk into what I still see happening. I was always nervous when I when I used to be in a room, whether it was at Goldman Sachs or at Google or even in the in the government to speak up because I'm like, oh, I'm not the expert on something. I wasn't the expert, even though I had a perspective that I, I think uh, mattered and it might have been more practical. But the fact is, it was a perspective of, of how to think about the, of the problem we were trying to solve. And I used to always be nervous about speaking up. And I uh, overcame that by just speaking up and just putting your opinion out there. It might not get heard, but the fact is you at least said something. Um, And it's important because many times I find that women have something to say that a lot of other people would have also said. Um, And how many times I've been in rooms where a woman says something and somebody's like, as Sally said, or as Angela said, or as Sonal said, and it sort of gets picked up in multiple ways. Um, But if we don't say anything, then no one knows that we have anything to say and that we're, we're bringing a perspective sometimes that is slightly different. It might be about implementation. It might be about a different way of looking at the problem. I think women sort of look at problems in different ways. They're not always looking at it in the same way as men, not good or bad. It's just, it's, a, it's like, you know, you see the elephant from different sides and, and you can bring a different perspective to it. And um, when it doesn't happen, it, it sort of can become groupthink too often where a group of men think a certain way because they see the elephant only from that side. And we don't get a full picture of how we're trying to solve the problem. And it it may not lead to the best outcome. And so then you're trying to fix the problem afterwards, as opposed to if we had spoken up and doing that. Still today, I cannot tell you how many colleagues I have or people who are leaving senior positions be like, well, I'm not qualified for that. I don't know if I should speak up on that. I still hear it, right? And it kills me every time I hear it because I'm like, we have to, I don't know, it's, it's, it, it, it gets taught out in schools or what happens. We have to give people confidence that voice matters and that perspective matters. And there's no right or wrong in this. It's a perspective in thinking through a problem. Absolutely. I'm going to change our view. I'm just playing around a little bit. <laughs> there we go. How do you like that view? Perfect. <laughs> it's, it, that's what we do. I mean, this is what we do with our clients, Onal, uh, is, is helping them understand their expertise and the value of them speaking up. And I'm sure you know the stat that women apply for jobs when they meet 90, Nine out of 100. 10. <laughs> yeah, 100% of the qualifications and men apply when they meet 50 typically. And just recently I heard that I heard I, I wish I could attribute it to the right person but I, I won't be able to. But that I heard that if you check 90 to 100% of the boxes you're overqualified for the job. Which I but think we, is, but we yeah. think we need to qualify for all of those things in those boxes. I mean, I just tell you the difference between me and my brother. My brother will hit three of the ten things, and he's like, "I can do that job," and I'll hit five of the ten things, and I'm like, "Can I?" I'll ask myself this question: I was like, "Can I do that job?" Um, and and it's sort of then you that mountain into, "Do I really want to do that job?" And sort of you sort of you can dig yourself into a hole rather than saying, "Is this something I'm excited about?" And is, uh, you know, do we have the skills to do it? Yeah. I mean, you've done, I mean, I've, we've all done multiple things. And for anyone that's a mom, God bless you, because you've done a thousand jobs and you have the ability to multitask, to get things done, to get to a result, because God knows you have to get somebody somewhere or if you're making sure everything is taken care of, the results are getting done. But we don't quantify that as a skill. We sort of see it as, oh, it's the thing I do. Yep. For sure. For sure. We see it all the time. We have a couple of clients right now who are this week and next week in job interviews. And sometimes they put the cart before the horse and they're kind of, 
thinking, you know, if, if I get that, then this, then this, like, no, no, one thing at a time. You can only do one thing at a time. So when you, when you, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that you probably have some colleagues and staff members that are watching or will watch later. So when you think about those who struggle with speaking up, who have ideas that should be heard, what advice do you have for them, especially as leaders in the workplace to speak mm -hmm. more powerfully? So one way of doing, at least the way I think about it for myself is, is, when I see someone not being able, not speaking up in a meeting or something, asking them to say, hey, um, we haven't heard from you in a while. Are you, you know, do you have anything to say? I know you have a lot of experience. Just offering a little bit of encouragement so they feel confident in speaking up against. What we, what we wanna do is build confidence. If it's not about pointing that you're not speaking, this is not law school. We're not gonna point to you and be like, you know, answer that question. But this is more about, um, how do we build the confidence to give people the ability to say, hey, you bring a perspective and we need to hear that perspective because as we're trying to solve for whatever we're trying to resolve, we need to we need to make sure we hear that perspective. And I try to be conscious of that. Sometimes subconsciously, I sort of was just so quickly wanting to move through a meeting. But I try to teach my colleagues also to say, hey, let's hear from that person because they're going to have a perspective that they bring. And let's make sure we understand why their perspective might be different. Because again, we go into groupthink and we don't always think about how many people's voices get left behind. I can I can even think about this today in one of the departments in our, in our team. Um, it's all men and some women, and too often the women's voices aren't at the table, um, and you don't hear from what they're thinking. How did they think about this? Would they have done it differently? But to be able to ask them a question in a way to bring them into the conversation. Um, and it's all of our responsibility, right? It's not just the leader's responsibility. It's our colleague's responsibility. I remember when we were at the White House, and I, this was actually a New York Times story that came out. It's like the women sometimes didn't get heard, so we would collect each other and we would they would bounce the ideas off and then somebody's like oh as susan said oh as samantha said oh as so you can do that and it doesn't mean uh, anything other than we can collectively also create an effort to help each other this is not just about competing as to whose idea is the best it's about how do we collectively get to whatever it is we're trying to solve for you mentioned that earlier about lifting up a person's name. And I think sometimes we hear, I heard a lot in the classroom, to piggyback off of that or to, to, to pick up to that point, to pick up where you left off. But this strategy of using a person's name, as Sarah said, I'd like to add, or that way you're not taking over someone's idea. I love that using someone's name and saying, I'm adding to what they started. Yeah. It's a nice way to validate, right? And it's a nice way to help someone feel that their their idea mattered. Um, at the end of the day, we want to give people dignity in, 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 in what they're doing and what they're saying. And um, we may disagree, but you can still do it in a dignified way. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's look at it from the personal standpoint. So we've looked at it from the impact it can have and does have on the organization when we don't have that voice at the table. You've mentioned some strategies right, of how to get others involved in the conversation. I guess my question to you is, is what do you see <clears throat> is the consequence when women choose just not to use their voice because of confidence, because of how they're feeling, how they're, they're lacking that self-esteem, no matter how encouraging others are in the room? What are the consequences? Do you, what have you seen as the consequences? I mean, I think the consequences can be, we're just not seeing period. So you're not even included in the conversation. Um, you're not, you're seen as a worker on the team and not a part of the team and not a con contributor to the team. It's like, okay, we'll just give you the task, go do the task, but it's different than feeling like you are part and feeling a, a part of the team. We, it's a belonging portion. Like, or is this just a transactional thing we're doing together? Or is this actually a thing we're doing together? So, you know, let's just say in a place like the United Way, if we as a team aren't thinking about how to move together, but we're just transacting, it's like, you do your thing, I'll do my thing. At the end of the day, we could do lots of stuff. We may not get anywhere. We'll just do a lot of stuff. 
and then and we should be able to have those conversations to be able to do that so i think what happens is sometimes um we not only just lose voice but you don't belong and you don't feel like you belong and it matters um how we create belonging so not speaking up also means you're removing yourself from the belonging from that conversation of the team and it's important that when you're on a team you you are part of the team not just a not just a contributor to the team and and that's how teams work together and that's how we're going to be able to, um, you know, do more together than it's one plus one equals three as opposed to one plus one equals two. Um, because when we work as a team, there's more we can do together. So not having that voice, not bringing the collaborative approaches, not bringing what I think women's superpowers are in many cases get left behind. And it could just become about, you know, moving quickly to solutions without thinking about how we do it differently and what are ways we can do that. So I think I think not having that voice is such a is such an um it's a loss. It's a loss to a team and it's a loss to an outcome. And when they're there, it's amazing how much we actually do. Oh, yeah, I, I just it, you reminded me of something. So I, I do a lot of editing and I'm I'm working on some success stories of our clients recently. And we have a client who when I asked her the question of how has your work with us Im impacted your, your work life, she was someone who thought she was going to leave her job and instead she invested where she was once she started to speak up. And I love stories. So it's always about the story. And she said, I've worked there for four years. I never put a picture up. And she said, I came back from vacation last week and I brought pictures. And when someone at work asked me to go to lunch, I said, yes because I feel like I'm an expert and then I have a voice at the table. And I thought, okay, that's not what we intend. I, we don't go put your pictures up at work, but that speaks to you. And I hadn't articulated it this way for myself. So I really appreciate you bringing that up to us is that's the belonging piece. Now she can show up as her authentic self. She also happens to be a black woman in a very white dominated space and male dominated leadership team. And for her to start to feel like she can own what she has, it impacts everything. It's the workplace is better. She feels better at work. She's not looking for another job. Right. She's going to lunch with her colleagues there. It's just, it makes a huge difference. And thank you for bringing up the belonging piece because I, I hadn't thought that through yet. Now it's such, it's so powerful and it's so, um, we, I, th I think sometimes we think we don't have power and we have so much power by the people we are and how we show up and the way we interact and bring people together. That is a superpower of women. I just wish we would all, rec I mean, we don't all have to, but we have to recognize it within ourselves that we have our own superpowers. It's, and, and the challenge I think is sometimes the, the definitions of success and the definitions of leadership are so male dominated that we don't recognize the definitions of success of women as how much they've done. And so we're starting to have these conversations, but some of the best leaders I have worked with, like at Goldman Sachs, um, Suzanne Nora Johnson, she was she was the she was one of the top five in the leadership at Goldman Sachs. She used to meet with every single woman that ever wanted to meet with her. And that example to me at such an early stage in my career was so important because it taught me how to lead and how to listen and how to help people be their best selves. But she was a big part of my success at Goldman Sachs because I mostly work with men and I didn't have examples of women, but she was such a great example that when I started to hire people onto my team, I looked for women and how to mentor them and what to do. It's the same that happened at Google. That sort of translated to Google. Of how do I bring a team of team together? The nine people that worked for me on my team were all women. Hmm. And and so like it, it sort of changes your perspective until you've had it and until you're a part of it. And recognizing what Suzanne did actually taught me a lot, you know, in my own career. Wonderful. That's wonderful. It, well, JRT? Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, <clears throat> we promised you we stay on time. So <laughs> we have a 30 minute mark. But, you know, one of the things, I, I guess it would feel not appropriate if we didn't say, if, do you yourself have any words of wisdom to those that are listening today or in the future? <laughs> Well, uh, let me just start with, I want to say thank you to both of you. I mean, this is such an important conversation and everybody that listens, 
anyone that listens, it matters because we all learn a little bit every time we hear something that speaks to us. So thank you for what you're doing and thank you for doing this podcast. It's so critical. Um, and thank you for having me. I'm grateful uh, to have this conversation with you. I, I have sort of three pieces of advice in general for women. And, and one is um, don't be afraid of who you are. In a world of authenticity, bring your full authentic self to whatever you do. It is not, um, and if someone doesn't like it, then maybe it's not the right place for you, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean you should bring, not bring your authentic self to the table um, and, and making sure that you are part of the conversations, you are engaging the conversations and really it's somebody else's fault if they can't deal with that, right? If they can't understand that, that's not yours. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's not um, yours to own, that's somebody else's to own. Um, Two, don't be afraid to take risk. Um, too often, we, we're always so mitigated against risk. But I will tell you, some of the best thing decisions I have ever made were the, bi the biggest risks I ever took. Um, I went to go work in Sarajevo after we finished bombing in 1995. And that was a whole different set of avenues opened up that I wouldn't have even ever thought about had it not been for that one risk to take. And you could say, oh, should I go to a post-conflict zone or shouldn't I do this or should I be doing that? But sometimes risk is where the greatest reward will be. And it also teaches you about who you are, which is what I learned about myself. I learned a lot about myself by taking that risk and understanding that. And three, failure is not a bad thing. Sometimes something doesn't work. It teaches you about what you like and what you don't like. I've got many failures in my life, but you know, I'll give you an example. Um, I, I went to go work for what was then Anderson Consulting in Accenture in 1992. And it, I was so bad at that job, um, but it taught me that consulting wasn't my thing, but it also taught me how to do coding, which I wouldn't have ever learned. And the coding portion actually helped me later on in my life, almost 10 years later, uh, when I was in between jobs and learning that I sucked at consulting. So I just want to be honest about it. But what was great about it is it taught me early what I didn't want to do, not just what I did want to do. And that is such that is so not a bad thing. And, and too often we're so looking for having to succeed at everything we do. Sometimes a failure is a lesson in how do I do things differently? If the next time I, I am in that situation, what would I do differently? So I, I think those three things, are like for women especially, I hope we take those risks. Don't let the failures get you down. And you know, be a part of that team and bring your authentic self to everything you do. Three great pieces of, of advice. And I, yes, I meant to say that in the beginning that didn't you set up the banks as the banking systems post conflict in Bosnia? Kosovo? Yeah, we created the currency there. Oh, wow. I mean, that's a whole other podcast episode and probably not on the theme of ours, but it, we just love to sit with you and hear all of your stories. That's incredible. Amazing. Thank you so much. And again, thank you for everything that y'all are doing. This is such a, it's so important. And I, we could have a conversation. I remember the last time we talked, we could have a conversation for two hours and we still wouldn't run out of things to say. Mm -hmm. For sure. We're so glad to know you and grateful to Tara for bringing us together. I did want to sh share the um, website for United Way. This is unitedway.org and you're working in the worldwide uh, portion of United Way, just to give you a chance to mention anything that you want about where you are right now. I want to make my pitch for United Way because I'm Please so excited do. about being here. Um, I think, you know, United Way is 1,200 United Ways across the world. And that means we are in every community across the United States and we're in 200 communities around the world. And why that matters is too often we think global and we forget the local. And what United Way does is it thinks about the local community, what's happening in your neighborhood, what's happening in your community, what kind of food issues, healthcare issues, education issues. We're there every single day and the local United Ways are in the communities every single day. They're, they're there when it's good and they're there when it's bad. And it's important to recognize that that is the power of a network of local United Ways that are doing the work in your in your communities every day. And why this organization matters so much is when we want to think about how to have impact and what are ways that we can get involved, volunteering, uh, supporting local organizations, United Ways are a great place to be because they're there. They're not leaving. 
you know, whether it's in Uvalde, Texas, or whether it's in, you know, Kansas City, Missouri, or whether it's in Chicago, Illinois, or wherever you may be, there is a local United Way doing work in your community. And I am so grateful to be able to work at the headquarters office to support this network to be the best possible so we can serve our communities the way we do. And I, I can't imagine a more important place to be working and to be working with a group of leaders, many of them who are women, um, who are just creating such great impact in their community. So uh, this, this particular slide is talking about our fund for Ukraine. And what's so important about this fund, it's very local, right? We're giving to United Ways in Romania, in Hungary, to really support the refugees that are coming out of Ukraine, that's food, shelter, but long-term assistance. How do you integrate into these communities? Because this war is not ending yesterday and it's not ending anytime soon. So a lot of these refugees are going to be there for a long term. So how do we create the support for them to do that? And that's local communities helping local communities. That's the best way to do it. It's not about just national organization going in. It's about local communities helping local communities. So I'm so proud of this, but I, I, this network is so incredible. So if you've not spent the time looking at your local United Way, please take the time to do that. Absolutely. And your specific expertise is such a perfect match for what you're doing. And they're lucky to have you. And we were so lucky to have had you on the podcast and appreciate all that you've shared with us today. Jen and JRT, thank you so much. We are honored. And I do agree with Jen. I think there will be a part two at some point. We can just keep this conversation going. All right, we're going to send you back to the green room for just a moment and close out the podcast and we'll sneak back in and have a Danish, not really the virtual Danishes when we come back in. Thank you so much, Sunal. Thank you. Bye. Well, JRT. How did we get so lucky, Tara? Thank you. Tara, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, so if you are watching us for the first time, we'll just tell you again who we are. I'm Jen V. And I'm JRT. And we are the co-founders of Voice First World. This is the podcast, Speak With Presence. We are live streaming and recording for the audio podcast. In our work, we help women. We coach women leaders speak with courage and clarity without being perfect so they can influence change in the workplace. When they influence change in the workplace, it also changes them everywhere else in their lives. And we are honored to do this work. If that sounds like something you need, go to voicefirstworld.com forward slash apply. And you can get on the phone and talk with us for about 45 minutes to see if it's a good talk with JRT, to see if it's a good fit for us to work together. We don't work with everyone because we can't help everyone. But if it's something that sounds like a good fit for you, we'll check it out and see if we're a good fit to work together. All right. That's all I've got for today. JRT, any last words from you? No, we will just look forward to being back here next week at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time for our next podcast interview with another powerful woman. So we will look forward to seeing you then. Thank you for letting me play with all of the toys while you were talking. I was dying to see what that would do. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. We will see you next time. Bye-bye. Okay.